Well, thank you for inviting me and for Lars for in, inviting me a second time and spreading the word about my new book. Um, the origin of this book is that about seven years ago, almost eight years ago, I left a 35 year corporate career in the US, having run design globally for Oracle for 11 and SAP for seven and decades of work before that um, and other uh, key software companies and um, was uh, signed up to teach a class in interaction design and I couldn't find a book that I thought was suitable, that there really wasn't a good book that focused on a method that I have used and team, like teams that I have led which were some of them pretty big 200, 250 person teams of UX uh, professionals uh, had used. And I thought this was all common knowledge. And I promised myself after five years of beating up on my graduate students, because I'm working in a, teaching in a, a master's degree, human factors uh, program, um, that I would stop and take a year off and write the book. And I did that. And um, with the help of my students, honestly, who were the guinea pigs. Um, so it really starts at the very beginning of the design process. And my first question to you guys, um, because this will be a somewhat interactive presentation, is what's the first thing you do when you start a new interaction design? And let me give you some constraints. Assume you've done all your user research. Assume you've got your personas. Assume you've done the journey maps. Assume all this information is actually accurate. Right? And now you're the designer and you've got a blank whiteboard in front of you or a blank sheet of paper. All right, you've got all your user stories. Everything's all planned out in a perfect world. What are you gonna do? Where do you begin once you've got all that information? What were you taught to do? What was I taught to do? Somebody wanna come off mute and give me an answer? We have an, uh, an answer in the chat. Uh, from Erdem says create user flows. Okay, that's actually um, a much more enlightened answer um, than I usually get. Um, I can't see the chat, so thank you. So um, I'll trust yeah. you to watch the chat for me. Beatrice, um, um, Beatrice also says define user journeys and then flows. Okay, so flows is a good is one place to start um, at a task level. What most people will say is they were told to start sketching, just brainstorm and sketch, right? And there's this magic moment, and that's where the name of the book comes from, um, where the creatives are supposed to just take all of this information and somehow synthesize it in their heads and start to draw a possible solution. Um, and there can be many solutions. And even, uh, Luminaries in the field like Bill Buxton hammered this point for decades about just sketching. Sketching is so important. And it is important, but I'm going to tell you not to do that. Actually, there's a better way to start than just um, this kind of uh, brainstorming based on prior experience or competitive products or your favorite UI um, and trying to copy things. So what is that? Well, the alternative is something that I've named semantic interaction design. And this has actually been proven. This is not really in that sense so new, and I'll explain the history. Um, with the intent is to be truly cognitive science-based and have a methodology. Um, and here, both for teaching and for practice, there's no difference in my world, um, that will scale to complex systems and ensure maximum usability. And what I want to do is level up the whole industry to be much faster and deliver better quality. And I am claiming, and I can support this, that you can be 10x faster and better. Now, the origin of semantic interaction design is not that I pulled it out of thin air. Um, I tend to uh, set the goal of um, reading 10,000 pages a year of the literature. So almost all the major journals and almost every new book that comes out. The ideas behind semantic interaction design can be traced back into the 1970s, the work of Phyllis Reasoner at IBM Watson Labs, and the notion of something called the task action grammar. And we're back in the days of uh, command line user interfaces, 
um, uh, where people were trying to understand the relationship between language and complexity. And there's similar thread of work in the UK by Spence and Apperley, um, which is actually where I learned about it at the very first Interact conference, which I think must have been uh, around 1982. Um, and then the world of cognitive science and various things that you're probably familiar with, like stages of action, um, that theory by Don Norman, um, Jim Foley, a retired professor emeritus at Georgia Tech right now. If you're not familiar with the name, Jim um, and Andy Van Dam invented computer graphics in the 1980s, literally. Uh, Nobel Prize quality work. Um, and Foley had this notion of design by levels, which was kind of adopted. And other people like Bonnie Nardi and Ben Schneiderman. Um, I know that Norman Foley and Schneiderman are reading the book, or actually Foley's finished reading it. Um, I've had conversations with all of them about it. And then there was a movement in the 90s on object-oriented UI led by a guy named David Collins. There's no science in that part, but there is some similarity. And then in 2012, Jeff Johnson and Austin Henderson published a book called Conceptual Models, which is the foundation of semantic interaction design. Both Jeff and Austin were on the original Xerox Park team that invented the graphical user interface. And they deal with the grammar level, which um, you'll understand by the end of this presentation. What I tried to do is make this into a complete system, both as a teaching pedagogy and as a methodology, and scale all the way up. And actually, you'll see in the book, Jeff wrote the forward for the UX Magic Walk. He's a good friend of mine. So what are we going to do? Well, I think you're going to learn a new method today. Um, it'll, you probably want to go a little deeper before you start practicing it. And the value proposition is simply faster, better. And by faster, I mean fewer iterations, fewer meetings, science-based trade-offs, get a 10x boost in your efficiency and how fast you can deliver designs. And then um, better quality. And when I mean optimal user in, uh, experience, what I'm really focusing on in this book is lowest cognitive load that um, is placed on the user, which of course would tend to mean the minimum number of screens and the shortest rows. Now, 10X is a bold claim. It's audacious, and that's the first chapter of the book, Audacity. So I'll give you some examples. Um, when I took over UX design uh, globally for SAP, um, so this was probably 15, 16 years ago, SAP had this miserable uh, customer relationship management software, had thousands of screens, wasn't even remotely competitive. Um, and my team was able to use this method and reduce it from thousands of screens to hundreds of screens. Um, flipping to an HTML front end and kind of ripping off a Yahoo portal style of UI um, using some of those patterns. Um, same level of functionality, and then same back end, no changes. And then in a move to the cloud, literally got it down to uh, a dozen screens or more and an iPad app with a slight reduction in functionality of um, some fringe features that product management was brave enough to give up because nobody had actually ever used them in the years of product had been on the market. So that is over 100x compression. And so you can imagine that the cognitive load that's induced um, by the UI that's projected to the user is quite a bit improved. Now, another example is a little more recent. This is an electronic medical record system for cancer treatment. It deals with radiation treatment, and it was a consulting project for Varian Medical Systems, which makes radiation treatment machines, uh, a product you hope you never have to see or use or have used on you. Um, and it had about 800 screens and it had a horrible, ugly UI, just as bad as the old SAP stuff. And these are some screens from the uh, new uh, UI, cloud UI, completely redone from scratch, back end to the landing page for the doctor, swim lane uh, page design template um, with cards representing objects of different types from appointments to actual lab results. Here the doctor is seeing all their patients. If they want to look at one patient, they get a social pattern. 
with a feed of all of the uh, object cards plus all the conversations synchronized in time. And there are some deep screens that deal with the actual medical records and chart. So we went from 800 to about 45 screens. Um, and this is on paper, or <laughs> on screen, so to speak, an 18x improvement. But that actually is not accurate. I want to go back to this for a minute. Because the original product only dealt with radiation feedback. The new product deals with radiation, chemo, surgery, genomic medicine, and has a full um, decision support, analytics, clinical trial matching, um, much, much more functionality and automation. And um, it's not just the system of record. It really um, does the planning for the cancer treatment. So while we went, we reduced the number of screens by 18X, we probably doubled or tripled the functionality um, to get to this product and pulled it off in about 45 screens. Um, then there's five that a doctor would use most of the time. Okay, when is this method applicable? So all of you probably have a favorite user-centered design lifecycle diagram. Um, this is one that I used at SAP years ago. And the thing I simply want to point out is this methodology, UX Magic, is about the design bubble. It's not that the other phases aren't important. I would just consider them necessary but not sufficient. In my over 40 years in the field, I think design has always been the weak link, that you can get really great requirements and still produce a mediocre design. Now, of course, if you have garbage requirements, then you're in a garbage in, garbage out situation. But this is where the magic really happens, when you go from that synthesis stage to really doing the problem solving. And that's really just to set expectations. This is not a full life cycle book. I'm not going to teach you how to do contextual inquiry. That's um, somebody else's job. Now, why is, was this so important in these products like medical or SAP or Oracle? Well, the answer is because design Darwinism doesn't work. And if you're not familiar with the term, I can send you a link to a beautiful Medium article. But the point is, it's not a legitimate form of iteration. This kind of A-B testing where you just throw a bunch of your population and by trial and error, you spend a ton of money. Um, and at best, you would get to a local maximum of quality because any inherent deficiencies are already locked in when you start your um, creating and spinning variations and looking at click metrics. And also, these methods simply don't scale. Um, you don't A-B test a cancer treatment product, right? That's how patients die, and that's how the FDA shuts you down. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and, and a lot of other classes of products. For example, I um, gave this talk to the Advanced Physics Lab in uh, the Washington Beltway area. They do the Mars rover, okay? There's no A-B testing of the Mars rover, right? It hits the planet, it either works or it doesn't work. Um, so how? Now let me move to the theory part. There's two cognitive science principles I'm gonna introduce you to in a moment, and there's four modular levels. Um, more than Foley had, but same kind of idea. There's the grammar level, visualization, so these are your design patterns, flow, which somebody already mentioned, very important, and then optionally game theory, um, all of which are relevant to semantic interaction design. And I'll walk you through those in a minute. But let me talk about the two principles. The two principles can be summarized as follows. Language, natural language, is the basis of conscious thought for human beings. It is not the basis of all thought. The primitive lizard brain deals with the fight and flight mechanism and emo some emotions. Um, but whenever you have to solve a problem, a puzzle, do anything of any complexity, you process it in your brain by using natural language, most normally your mother tongue that you learned as a child. And we know that language grammar, the structural grammar correlates with cognitive complexity. That's a well-established fact in linguistics and also in the theory of, and the psychology of computer programming. Different computer languages um, introduce different cognitive load levels based on their grammar. Now, cognitive load can be measured in a usability lab 
you don't know how to do that, ask me in the Q&A. Um, it's not uh, expensive um, and not too hard to do um, at a kind of scalar way. Um, what I'm telling you is new, is the cognitive load can actually be predicted in advance before you even draw a single screen. Sounds kind of like magic, doesn't it? So let me clarify my terminology. When I use the word grammar, and we're talking about graphical user interfaces, um, we look at now for many decades, the notion of actions, right? Uh, as you might see in menus, applied to objects, which are generally things in the canvas area of a graphical user interface. And every object has a set of attributes. For a graphics product, it will be colors and fonts. Um, for a medical product, um, it will be a bunch of uh, cancer treatment parameters. Now, here's where the cognitive load comes in, okay? Uh, in my career, I had the opportunity to design several word processors and fix several word processors. Some of the first ones were actually products that I had to fix were uh, in DOS. And all of these had really horrible grammars. Um, they had hundreds of keystroke and function key commands um, for cutting, and copying, and printing. And the objects are pretty consistent of word processing as humans would understand them as the character a word, a paragraph, a document, et cetera. And when the grammar is really sloppy, so there's a lot of redundancy, like some objects, you know, the command to get rid of it is cut, and another object, the command is remove. So there's redundancy, irregularity, and inconsistency. You end up with a very sparse grammar um, when you try to map the number of objects and number of actions, and sparse is bad. In a perfect world, everything would be symmetrical, regular, and consistent. So we could have these same objects of paragraphs, pages, and documents, and we would have what you guys, I'm sure, take for granted, because most of you are probably digital natives, actions that are generally predictable and consistent, like cut, copy, paste, and print. And this would be a perfectly dense grammar. It doesn't exist in the real world, there will always be some exceptions, and I'll show you some in a minute. But um, if you are building your UI around the densest possible grammar, you are going to introduce the lowest cognitive load. But I'm going to pause now, and with the exception of Lars and any of you who attended the global UPA session, um, somebody tell me what you think the math is. So how much worse is sparse than dense? Is it twice as bad? Is it a million times as bad? Somebody give me an idea. What do you think the math looks like? Come off mute, please. If I had to guess, I'd say it's exponentially. Wow, did you read the book? No, just, just, just guessing. Well, you guessed perfectly correctly. <clears throat> this is the math. Modulo a few coefficients if you have a PhD in cognitive science. This is basically what's going on. If you had a perfectly dense matrix, the scalar approximation of cognitive load is equal to the number of actions and plus the number of objects. As the matrix gets sparse, um, it becomes and can be approximated as the number of actions times the number of objects. So there is definitely an inflection point in these systems um, where they go exponential in terms of the cognitive load um, that they introduce. And so your goal is to stay down here. Um, what is the threshold point? My experience says 20 to 30 percent white space kind of correlates with the inflection point in the conceptual model. Um, assuming, again, I'll show you some examples of real ones um, so you get a scale for size. But maybe we're talking, you know, eight to ten objects and eight to ten actions, if properly um, derived, can represent almost anything. Okay, so let's look at a real example. In that 800 screen to 45 screen with the crippling of functionality, this is what it looked like when we were done. There were about ten objects that um, the patient, the person a medical record, so that's the historics, the treatment plan, so going forward, 
and then a bunch of operational stuff like appointments, tasks, and messages. And then the notion of a care team. So this is a social group. And then you can really reduce this to um, a small number of actions um, that are very generic, creating an updating, of course. There's no delete because you void in a medical product. You never erase data if you do the effort that we check you down. And then there's a lot of workflow stuff that happens in medical. Um, so there's accepting and rejecting and delegating and approving. And there's a lot of referring to moving the patient from one specialist to another and doing some transfers, and, um, et cetera. So effectively, all of cancer treatment in every discipline could be represented conceptually by 10 objects and 10 actions. And I want to clarify that this conceptual model is what you as the designer are pushing out onto the screen. Do not confuse this with the mental model notion, say, from Don Norman, which is the a priori thing that's in people's heads. The mental model for cancer treatment is what people learned in medical school. And there are places you need to um, address that. But the conceptual model is the designer's language that you have created to organize all the functionality around. And you will express through your flows and your design patterns. And so that takes us to the design patterns and how to do this in practice. So let's look at the different levels of grammar, visualization, flow, and game theory. Around. Where do objects and actions come from? Dave Collins, in his uh, 1995 uh, Object uh, UX book, calls this foraging, process foraging for nouns. But nouns basically turn into objects, verbs turn into actions, and adjectives in natural language turn into the attribute of an object. Very simple. And there's a bit of a process here. So we're going to define our objects in action, enumerate all the attributes for every object, which is basically the functional scope of the product. And then we have to go through a prioritization process because not all object action pairs are equally important. So in the foraging process, the place most people would start is user stories that you would have deduced from your user research and your personas. Um, and journey maps, a series of user stories. Now, these also could be used in the Agile process, though those often are a little bit too technical, so I've always had to expand the user stories to truly represent a functional scope. In my book, um, one of my uh, hypothetical case studies is a animal rescue, humane society kind of site. Um, I also use the cancer one, so we have quite a range of complexity. And if you took the user stories for the pet rescue, you would see, as a parent, person object, I want to find, action, a friendly, attribute, dog, object, that will help teach my children, person object again, to be responsible. As an elderly widow, person object, aka a user, Living alone, I want to adopt, action, a dog, object for my protection, attribute. It's as simple as writing all the possible user stories and go out more than the MVP, because you want to look out two, three, four versions if possible, and figure out the candidates for your objects and actions. You'll get to a very sparse matrix when you identify all the candidates, um, and that's normal. And your job is to compress it to the minimum conceptual uh, model. How do you compress it? You compress it in two ways. You pivot some objects, excuse me, you pivot objects to be, become attributes of other objects. Um, so for example, um, a calendar is just a design pattern, so that doesn't even belong here, okay? Um, an event, basically, uh, in this particular um, use case, only exists um, as a meeting between a dog and an owner uh, to, to see if they bond, right? Services are an attribute of the organization. So you pivot as many objects to be attributes of the uh, primary objects, and then you pivot as many actions as possible to be state changes, an on-off, yes-no attribute of the objects. And in a short amount of time, 
you would say, looking at this, we're in the exponential space. So probably a scalar uh, value for cognitive load of 66 versus nine for this compressed version. And it takes most people, once they kind of understand the method, about half an hour to do this. In my class, we do this. Um, and my grad students look at sites all over the country for these pet rescues. And on average, they have between 200 and 300 screens. And our first uh, assignment is to do something uh, in the same functional scope, actually larger functional scope, um, and do the whole redesign. And they're on average able to do it in 20 to 26 screens. So they're able to get a 10x compression. Um, and this is for some of them the first design class they've ever taken. So it's mentally a little tricky to get this notion of the pivot and compress and crush. But once you get it in your head, um, it really only takes about 30 minutes to get down to a good starting point. Now, the next step is figuring out the attributes. Obviously, an animal has a species and a breed and an age. And then more importantly, it has personality characteristics, which would allow you to match it to a human being and what their need is. This is a trivially small table of attributes. It actually gets very large and attributes can be hierarchical. Um, and uh, objects have relationships and they can be many to many or many to one. So sometimes an object, uh, primary object can still behave as an attribute of another object. And I'll show you an example in the medical case. Um, now, what's important about attributes is they don't add significant cognitive load. So this is another really key point in the semantic uh, method. When we deal with attributes in graphical user interface, our brains are using recognition memory, not recall memory. And our ability to recall um, is the best. We are the best pattern matchers on the planet as far as the animal species go. Um, and we do a really good job of recalling things. And generally speaking, in a GUI, um, the recall is really looking at a dialog box, a property sheet, um, a toolbar, some icons, we don't have to pull these out of the back of our brain and use recall, which is very expensive. So again, the more you can pivot um, functional scope to be represented as attributes, the more you're lowering the cognitive load. And then as I noted, finally, prioritization. Um, in the human factors parlance, a task would be equal to an object plus one or more actions. Um, and the user has different degrees of importance for these pairs of objects and actions than the business usually does. So you have to look at both. What I recommend um, is dealing with this in a simple matrix um, based on frequency, how often do people do that, op that task, and how many people do the task. And so if you create a simple matrix and have the prioritization decisions and discussion up front before you even draw a single screen with product management or any management and figure out what are the by many, pe many people are gonna do it and they're gonna do it frequently. And these are the object action pairs that need to be visualized on the home screen or no more than one click away. Other things are done by many people but they're done rarely like creating an account. So you have gotta get it this flow right, no doubt about it but um, it's not uh, gonna be stuck forever right in your face. And then obviously there are cases where things are done by very few people. Um, and maybe if it's a power user or admin, it's very rarely. And then for consumer software, so whenever it's pay-per-click, right? Um, I re recommend adding a financial row or column. And you have this notion of by many people like micro revenue, is when you're allocating screen real estate to advertising versus macro revenue, which might be uh, adding to cart or agreeing to a subscription. I do not, in my practice, mix the financial with what users want to do. Um, users want to get something, they don't want to watch advertising. And these things compete for real estate on the screen. If you're doing medical products, forget it. You don't need this row. And most enterprise, you don't need it either. This will save you a ton of time. Right? Have those discussions before you start to draw, because in my experience, if you don't, the first two or three iterations of mocks, uh, as soon as they go back to product management, it's all about prioritization because nobody planned this out. And you just throw those mocks away 
and it's a ton of reuse and rework for nothing, right? Have those discussions before you draw a screen. And it's pretty straightforward. So if all you did was master this grammar level, um, what could you do with it today? Uh, well, first, if you're a user researcher, this is very relevant. Half of my students will focus on user research careers when they get their master's degree. Okay, the other half will uh, go design. You can use this as a heuristic evaluation technique because you can actually assess the cognitive load of your own existing products and competitive products by doing a little reverse engineering. Then you can find the mismatches between the user's mental model in the Don Norman sense, what they a priori are looking for and what you're communicating. And I think this is a very um, important qualitative heuristic evaluation technique, a uh, quantitative, excuse me, um, as opposed to the uh, qualitative approach uh, proposed by Jacob Nielsen that we've been using for decades. And that's with no disrespect to Jacob, we're friends, we actually co-authored a book together in the movie. Um, and he does have a copy of UX Magic, as I sent it to him, he actually looks close to me. Um, number two, if you're starting off a new product with a blank sheet of paper, this is the only sane way to go, in my opinion. You're just gonna minimize the amount of work to get to the first design, and you're going to uh, save a ton of time if you do that prioritization exercise before you start to sketch. And if you are where most people are in the real world, dealing with the evolution of something that exists, the main takeaway is add features as new attributes of existing objects. Try really, really hard not to introduce the notion of a new object into a product that's already in the market and people are used to using, right? This will minimize complexity and it will slow the increase of cognitive load as um, you have the pain of feature creep. Um, from version to version. Now, we can do better than those three things. Go to visualization. What do I mean by visualization? So in the world of graphical user interface, visualization is its own hierarchy, right? And we um, start with components and we build them into graphical widgets and then we build them into archetypes. And by archetype, I mean a page template that was recognizable. Excuse me. We have design languages, and I'll explain what I mean by that, and architectures. But this is really the hierarchy. And actually, for the most part, I teach this from the bottom up, but most of the time you will find you practice it um, from the top down sometimes. And you'll see why with my examples. Just to clarify my terminology, components, raw, components, buttons, labels. Throw them into a grid, starts to look like a calendar. Add a few controls, it becomes a date picker. It grows up um, and leaves adolescence and becomes a calendar pattern. The people will walk up to any of these patterns and they will have expectations. They will understand that if they see the calendar grid, that there are gonna be different views and filters and search and different objects that they can um, hone in on and, and zoom in and zoom out on. Then it's all um, in their heads. So let's look at components. I'm gonna walk you through kind of quickly here. If you look at the raw primitives for graphical user interfaces, there's about a dozen of them, and I'm obviously not gonna read you this table. Most of these components, like checkboxes and radio buttons, or regular buttons, have a purpose in life when they were invented at Xerox Park almost three and a half decades ago. Most of them were designed to display an attribute value. A few of them were designed, like a button, to uh, visualize an object, and uh, visualize an action, excuse me. And some of them can represent an object, right? The main point is you shouldn't be using trial and error. You should be consistently picking your components to express either an attribute value, an action value, or an object, and not using them for more than one thing in your design system. In real life, I would take it a, an eraser and knock out about a third of these Xs if I was doing a design language. Let me show you some, a good example, right? In LinkedIn, we have um, the menu 
component used to represent uh, objects, in this case, jobs, on the job screen, just a card equals a job. We also have a different visualization of the menu system, of a menu component representing actions. These can coexist with no uh, uh, cognitive load increase because the visualizations are totally different. If these actions were represented as cards in another page, the user would really be screwed. So this is fine. We're using the components, variations of the component, but they're visually distinct per purpose. Here in Yelp, we have a bad example, right? Um, here, we have the tab control, right, being used to represent the filter state, um, so an object filter between um, inbox and sent. Um, and then we have the exact same control sitting over here, um, and it represents an action. So this is a F or a D minus if you turn this in in class, right? This is just completely wrong from a semantic standpoint. And actually, Yelp is a good place to go for bad examples. Um, and it's just full of these kinds of mistakes. And oh, by the way, nobody mentioned this in the intro, um, but I did invent tabs um, so long ago that the patent's been expired for over a decade. But Microsoft was kind enough to infringe it in Windows 95, so that's something you can ask me about in the Q&A. Um, but let's talk about widgets, okay? And here are uh, um, the kind of common widgets, lists, tables, tree controls, forms, cards, some property sheets, leaderboards, if you're into gaming. Same issue. These were designed, um, these patterns, by their inventors, generally to either represent an attribute, an object, or an action. In this case, wipe out 50% of the Xs in your design language to be hyper consistent. But again, don't do trial and error. They all need to reflect the grammar going up that, up, sorry, this way, the pyramid, right? Um, now, what does an example look like? Here's a bad example. From now on, I'm only gonna show bad examples because they're much more interesting. About six months before the book came out, I got a request from the Google material team in San Francisco and New York um, to do a preview of the book and the idea of the semantic design. Because the material design is really a visual design system. It has almost no semantics. Actually, most style guides don't, but theirs is the worst. And here in the material design, the card is being shown and, and representing an object, a restaurant. And we can make a reservation, which is a local action on the card. This, this is what I call a transactional action. It moves the flow forward. Here, the card is being used to represent an attribute, the weather in Hong Kong. And the local action is not grammar relevant. It's not transactional. Expand just opens the card to show you more detail. This is also a semantic screw up because this the local action is the same colors, same font, same location. Um, and we used Google Material um, for the cancer treatment product. And we had to undo a lot of this stuff. And I'm not exaggerating when I say the distinction between this actually is a real action and this is not will kill a patient, right? This again, would, the FDA would shut you down. So we had to um, override quite a lot of this. Now, you may think my list of widgets is kind of small, and that's true. There are a lot of widgets that are not grammar relevant, um, and I identify them like a dialog box or toolbar are like Switzerland, they're neutral. They, are, they take on the semantics of the controls that you put inside them. Um, and you can put different kinds of controls inside them with enough white space, and that's fine semantically, right? There can be actions and attributes in the toolbar, just don't randomize the icons, cluster them and put some white space. And then controls like zoom and pan and scroll, again, are not relevant to the grammar. They just move the view around on the screen. Now let's talk about visualization. Okay, at the archetype level. An archetype is a page template. These are patterns that in the sort of digital uh, literacy world, 
a lot of people understand and they'll come up to them and know how they work. I think my grandchild was born uh, and learned all this in vitro, um, given uh, he's five years old and um, yeah, is totally fluent in computers um, and taught himself to read and do math already. And he has starting kindergarten in the fall. But he knows these patterns. And he knows what a catalog is. He knows what a menu is. Frankly, he, he's very proficient in Zoom because he's been taking classes online. Um, but we know these. We know what a portal looks like. We know what a tool in Canvas looks like. Could be PowerPoint. It could be Sketch. It could be AutoCAD. It doesn't matter. We know what a dashboard looks like. Again, knock out 60% of the X's in your language here in your design system. But these generally are going to be representing some set of one or more objects. And again, don't mix and match. If you're using a portal style UI to hold different kinds of objects um, as your home screen, don't use a portal style UI to hold a bunch of attributes in the user profile setting. Okay, you're just screwing up um, the communication to the user. Now, let's look at Facebook. They've changed the thing I'm going to complain about, um, but it's still bad. Okay, if you looked at Facebook and you took it apart, we have global actions in the header. We have a bunch of local actions like join and add a story. The objects in Facebook basically come down to people and, and the content, the posts, right? This is what we understand to be the working um, data set. And then here on the left, they have a screw up where with the exact same icons of style and out, not much clustering, objects, actions, a bunch of attribute filters, and more actions. And they tried to simplify this, but it's still a disaster. But they've established the archetype of this feed widget in the center. Um, and so, for the social pattern. And now that I've explained archetypes, let me explain what I mean by design language. This is when you start to put everything together and you have a system. And I'm not talking about a visual language. I'm talking about the semantics and the syntax and semantics of the conceptual model and how you push your grammar out onto the screen. And in this case, I'm going to go back to a case study um, to make it really uh, hopefully clear. Um, and I'm going to take you through a day in the life of an object and an action. And I'm going to use the medical product again. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated, but you'll understand what I mean when I say an interaction language. So let's take the appointment. This one's pretty straightforward, and we're going to walk this object through. In the home page for doctors, the swim lane archetype is used. You saw the screen before, and it's cleaned up to make it simple for you. We have the appointment object. The appointment object has a behavior where you click and the card expands. In the appointment object, you will see the appointment attributes, the time and the room, but in, you will also see attributes of the patient, Josephine Baker, right? Because this is what the doctor needs to know. They're running down the hall, they're doing 30 consults a day. They're about to step into the room with the patient. They are really happy to look on their calendar, particularly the mobile version, and they want to see the state of this patient, right? What's the cancer staging? What's the latest treatment date? You know, when was the last uh, chemo session? So again, objects nest. They have many-to-many -many relationships with other objects. You may be putting attributes of more than one object in the context of something like an appointment. Then we have the local action menu. And here, the local action menu is always in the lower right, and it contains actions that are relevant to the persona. It knows who you are when you are um, logged in, obviously. And mostly a doctor would create a task before or after this appointment for somebody else on the care team to do, right? Even if it's sched rescheduled, he's gonna create a task for the front desk. The doctor's not gonna schedule an appointment. If we go to the calendar view of the EMR, the same appointment card exists. We're now in the calendar archetype instead of the swim lane archetype, and the persona is the front desk clerk. And the front desk clerk 
has a slightly different local action menu. They can still create a task for somebody. Maybe a room needs to be cleaned, um, but it's mostly about um, managing the appointments. And then the appointment object shows up in the patient chart. Here we have Josephine again. Um, now we're in a portal archetype and there's a slight difference, right? The card is still here and it may seem a little odd to you that the diagnosis is in the appointment card um, and it's also in the header. But uh, the appointment could be, there can be more than one diagnosis. Chemo can induce um, diabetes temporarily, like gestational diabetes. So this could be an appointment um, to get a prescription for metformin um, and not actually immediately related to the cancer treatment. It could be for a side effect. So now the patient information goes to the header of the page, the local action becomes a global action, and it can actually create any object. You can create an appointment, a task, whatever, anything for Josephine's treatment. But again, the nurse is probably the primary persona for digging through the chart. And so again, the uh, appointment card object representation visualization, again, remains consistent. Now, I'm gonna walk you through the void action. The void action uh, is because you don't delete data, as I mentioned. Now, I have a quiz question here for you guys. Without having gone to medical school, um, you should be able to look at this screen, the diagnosis screen, and find the medical error. What is wrong with this data? I'm going to wait until somebody comes off mute to take a sip of water. Anybody see it? Just look at the header. Um, the it's a prostate diagnosis on a female patient? Yep, that is um, a medical error unless this patient had gender reassignment surgery, in which case you still have a prostate and it's in a very different location. But let's assume that this was a drunk intern who was doing the cancer staging and screwed this up um, and that Erna um, did not have gender reassignment surgery so we need to get rid of this. And so we have the card here and the local action menu and we would click void diagnosis. And it would be struck out. And when the filter for seeing what's void is unchecked, we get down to a clean screen. Generally speaking, you would always be in this um, unchecked state. Only for forensic issues would you um, look at what was uh, voided. Now click on the card, the card expands. And what I want to point out about the behavior of void, this is, gets a little bit complicated, is the cancer staging is very complicated in terms of all the different parameters, but you'll notice that there's include voided and void this stage. This is done over several days. So if somebody makes a change, it might not be a mistake, they got a new pathology report, right? They have to void the old information um, and they don't throw away the whole diagnosis. So here we have the void action behaving at the global level and also at the local level. And there's a whole section in the book about the um, taxonomy of actions behaving at local and global level. So this is an example where it can get really complicated. Um, but the same action, we have documents. Somebody scans in a new pathology report or an imaging report and something's wrong, wrong patient, right? It's got to be voided. So you click on it and you would, you know, see the document and there's a void button. You go to the patient, the journal, right? These are just free form notes. Again, if somebody accidentally writes something and it's incorrect and they save it, they have to go in and void it. If they void it, they cannot unvoid it, right? There's no undo in a medical product. You would have to enter it again or the FDA again would shut you down. Okay? So again, you just see how tight the void action has to be um, and how it works at the global and local level. And finally, I'm gonna just briefly touch on architecture at the top of the pyramid. 
in looking at the screen, think of box equals a page, a full screen, and that there are, and a screen would likely contain one or more objects here. And there are five patterns that are pretty much dominate in graphical user interface. The sequential, like a shopping cart, PayPal, hierarchical, like most websites, hub and spoke, some journalistic websites, and enterprise apps. The matrix, which is hard to explain, but you can go anywhere, but you always transit through other screens to get there. And then the network, where any big object screen can take you and you can navigate to any other um, in any t at any time. This is only used for professional level products. And all of these have a set of eight human factors characteristics ranging from location awareness to efficiency. And obviously sequential, you have very high location awareness when you're in a wizard, right? You can't really get lost, but boy, you get into this network pattern and you can get lost, right? So you really have to, um, again, know the content really well. The reason I bring this up is um, the grammar is uh, sensitive to the architecture and vice versa. In the medical product for the professionals, not the patient half, we looked at hierarchical hub and spoke and network. And we changed the grammar slightly, maybe 10, 15% and how you're gonna represent things. As you move towards the network, you have to have a fairly small number of objects so it becomes its own uh, nightmare and in terms of cognitive load. So, as I mentioned before, you may um, start at the top of the pyramid looking at your architecture, even without drawing screens. Um, but note that you will modify the grammar. Um, some you know, patterns just work better with different architectures. Okay, so who understands all these patterns, including the architectures and how screens are expected to connect? Well, about 5 billion people, all of you included right, thanks to the internet and smartphone penetration. Um, every digital native has uh, a priori understanding of those dozen patterns of social and desktop and portal um, that I identified, right? Interestingly, the other 2.7 billion people on the planet, whether they're literate or not, and by literate, I mean they can read, um, the only way they can begin to participate in the world of human-computer interaction is by associating in their heads physical world metaphors um, to be proxies of objects and actions on the screen. So, and this is the only way you can actually teach anybody to use uh, uh, computers if they're not, um, you know, weren't born uh, with this knowledge in vitro, in vitro. And of course, most of you, like me, probably are in the digital economy. And so we're really only focused on that top 5 billion people. So you really have a, you know, 99.9999% probability that people are gonna walk up with expectations to everything you design. And then I'm gonna very briefly touch on flow and game theory. The major thing with flow um, is that actions propel the task through the objects. And going back to my dog example, dog rescue, we have the, just a simple flow like donate the dog, the owner, the organization, um, and money are the objects. And using the Jesse James Garrett style of experience uh, design for boxes and arrows, um, we would basically expect to see a donate button on the home screen and some pay action button on a credit card screen. But really what's happening is the home screen is gonna show multiple objects, dog of the day, some happy owner stories, the donate screen is all about the money object, and thank yous about the organization, and then we have to figure out where to route somebody um, afterwards. And maybe there's a detour to the volunteer, and here volunteering is a proxy for money. Time for crushing. You know, if somebody volunteers, that's basically just a variation of money as far as the organization is concerned. But again, actions propel the uh, objects, right? That's just how, that's all you really have to do through the flow. Now, if you have the smallest number of objects and the smallest number of actions, you will have the shortest flows. If you have the shortest possible flows, you will be keeping cognitive load down. So you can see how the grammar is operating. 
at the flow level. I actually, in the classroom, um, teach flow before I teach visualization. I do grammar flow, go back to the visualization, and then game theory is second semester. We don't even get into that in the first semester. Okay, now let's talk about game theory. The question with game theory is can you motivate and guide human behavior to favor a specific object and action pair at first a task? In the world of game theory for interaction design, we have three flavors. Gamification, which is a reward, uh, adding reward elements to incentivize productive work. So we were gamifying call center app, sweatshop labor, right? Or we're gamifying a medical product. I do that a lot. I'll show you an example. Uh, gameful interaction design is where we create a proxy game for the actual transactional task. So imagine you're, you're using something that looks like Tetris, but when you're done putting all the little boxes in the right spots, you filled out an expense report and it's sent to your boss to be approved. Um, if you're having trouble imagining that, I have a student who actually implemented that as their thesis, okay? But you make a game, but it's really work. And then Captology, which stands for Computers as Persuasive Technology, is the kind of uh, invention of uh, BJ Fogg at Stanford. And this is where you're trying to persuade users to change their behavior. In all three of these, we're trying to minimize cognitive load. That's not the same as pure games. In pure games, we are actually trying to increase cognitive load up to the just below the maximum level that users um, can handle and still win the game. Now, how does this map to conceptual models and grammar? It's actually pretty simple. The gamification flavor uh, provides action incentives. The gameful design flavor, you do an object substitution. And captology is basically manipulating attribute values on the screen. So whenever you see a only one left at this price, that is captology, right? Um, any discounts, deals, any of that stuff, that's all used to manipulate you. And when there's only one left in that price, in that um, at that price, that's a lie. The warehouse is full of them, I guarantee you. Okay? So why would you use game theory? Well, you're trying to increase or decrease some human behavior. Um, if it's enterprise gamification, you're usually trying to increase productivity or pro uh, performance, sorry, um, or you're trying to decrease errors and boredom. Um, if it's medical products, you're trying to um, increase the patient's health. You're targeting in game theory intrinsic and extrinsic motivators, and this is a kind of a human factors in the UX community. I don't really need to explain much about this. Intrinsic are human motivators based on how we feel about ourselves. Extrinsic is how we feel we're being perceived externally. Extrinsic, the major ones are fear of failure and greed and competition. Intrinsic, love and mastery. Etc. So when you go into using game theory, um, in the screen in the center is the Nissan Leaf electric cars owner portal, which is brilliantly gamified. And I, I don't know who did it, um, but I'd love to meet them. There's a social game where car owners in different continents are competing with each other to save trees. A tree actually represents a carbon offset. And it's a competition, but it's a social competition. However, you see the notion in the game literature of mechanics, right? There are mechanics like connection, feedback, narrative, reciprocity. A game mechanic is a combination of a flow and a design pattern, right? So you can take any one of these standard Amy Jo Kim 21 game mechanics or 28 common game mechanics, and when you move them into interaction design, they are just some combination of a flow and usually a design pattern at the widget level that we've already seen. This is all around you. I legally acquired this slide. This is Facebook's game uh, application. They're intentionally introducing social pressure, unpredictability, and scarcity to drive engagement. And these are the mechanics that they're using, right? This is intentional. 
They didn't do this by accident, right? Um, trying to keep eyeballs on screens to maximize advertising. You can use this for good. These are screens from the Blue Star Diabetes Solution from a company named WellDoc. Um, and I do have a relationship with this company for truth and advertising. Um, and this is the first instance of digital medicine. It's really a breakthrough product. It's prescribed by doctors, reimbursed by an insurance company. It's FDA class two approved, and it is legally a pharmaceutical. It has a drug reimbursement code, and it's adjudicated to Walgreens and CVS. And it has to be refilled every 90 days and be prescribed every year. And in clinical trials in multiple countries, this solution has been shown to reduce the A1C, so the uh, uh, resting blood glucose level of high-risk type 2 diabetics by two points. And metformin, the leading pharmaceutical for type 2 diabetes, averages 1.8 in clinical trials. So here we have a solution for patients, um, software only, that outperforms the leading pharmaceutical. Right? And you'll see, just in looking at the screens, there are challenges and there are rewards. And basically, we're trying to keep the patient on their meds, proper diet, good exercise, good sleep, and mindfulness. Right? This product can dose insulin. It can kill you. It can absolutely kill you. And it is now available for type 1. So it really, um, you make a mistake dosing insulin for type 2, that's very bad if you make a bad mistake for type one, it's game over, okay? So there's a lot of this um, applied game theory in here, as well as a very sophisticated expert system that understands your prescriptions and diagnoses and your medical regime. And that's it, okay? So um, we have some time for q and I've kind of given you the overview. Again, a reminder, this book, and the methodology is just to become a Jedi in this bubble, right? Everything else you know for the before and after still stands, has to be done. There's more to the book um, that I've talked about. There's a chapter on raw basic graphic design is even if you do everything in the pyramid correctly, you can still screw up the communication of the conceptual model of bad graphic design. So I, and there isn't a really good book on this either. Um, there could be a really great book, um, uh, and I know somebody who I'm trying to encourage to write one. Um, myth, the chapter myth is about style guides and when to ignore them because they screw up your conceptual model um, or how to write one and get the semantics in. And then chess is just a rant on, short rant on the future of design and the design profession. Um, the Publishers, the Interaction Design Foundation, I hope you'll all become a member. It's a nonprofit in the Netherlands. Um, the book is available on Amazon. Um, it's 350 pages full color, and it's lots and lots of examples. Um, and Lars can tell you all about the book. I have just scratched the surface. Um, this is not a skinny book, um, but there's actually more. <laughs> um, and so just for individuals, um, let me wrap up. If you found this interesting, Please post on social media, tell your friends about it. Um, friends at other companies, I'm happy to do this presentation for free um, to any UX team in the world, um, as long as we're in the shelter in place situation. Um, and uh, I've done about 30 um, in the last six weeks. Um, and do join the Interaction Design There's a Foundation. There's a lot of great material there. And if you're a manager, I do have material on how semantic interaction design works with data viz and information architecture. I actually teach a class on that. I elected not to put it in the book. It would have become a 700 page book. And um, after a year of um, no income, we're just working on the book. Um, I had to kind of get back to work. Um, but maybe eventually I'll write a second book on these two topics. So that's it. Time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions. So if you wanna ask a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself.
Um, I have a question. Um, so when creating a conceptual model, um, what would be a good strategy for, you know, maybe, maybe you didn't do the research yourself and it's been handed off to you and the use cases um, have been handed off to you. And you don't necessarily know um, the frequency of, you know, which actions are being, should be prioritized. How do you go about um, catching up on all that information? Is there a good way to start aside from just researching what is already in place? No, I think um, generally speaking, you would have to do that research. Um, typically, product managers have a, an opinion on this topic. If your company's in business, you could look at support logs and see what people are having trouble with because that's most often likely to be the high frequency stuff. So you might not have to go do user research. You might have that um, in your uh, support organization. Um, but yes, you have to, um, you have to make some assumptions, right? Um, and again, if you're wrong, you change the prioritization. Also note that depending on where you have multiple actor scenarios for a product, you might have um, prioritization matrix for um, each persona um, based on how you personalize the product. We actually, in the medical product, introduced after the first release um, a design for nurse navigators we had never used or considered the matrix and based on feedback from nurse navigators who dealing with 40 or 50 patients at a time um, they uh, asked for something that the matrix architecture fit nicely um, and just because of the modularity of the system and the building blocks um, it, it took about 90 days to, for, you know, from start to engineering delivery to make a, a version. And if you log in and you identify yourself as a nurse navigator, you get a different navigation system. Um, and their priorities were different. So it really depends, but at least argue about it and make informed guessing of before course. you start right, creating mocks that get thrown away because all you're doing is arguing about what goes on the homepage. Absolutely. Thank you. So other questions? I know that listening to me is like taking a drink from a fire hose. It's really fast. <laughs> so I have, I have a question. Um, this is kind of the first time I've heard about anything like this in, in sort of determining uh, kind of what goes where on a, on a GUI. Um, were you saying that the way to, the first step in sort of determining what the actions and the objects and the attributes are was pulling those from uh, the user stories? So where you had the dog and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Figure out and basically figure out what you're trying to communicate, what you're going to push out, right? And note, uh, as I've worked with several companies since the book has come out, to help them adopt this. It's not the data model, right? The conceptual model is more related to the process that people wanna do, right? I had some guys at Cisco trying to do an admin app for a very complicated router. And they're showing me basically the database, the schema for how the router hardware works. That's not what the user cares about, right? The user has a process. Right. Keep the box up so I don't lose my job, right? We got to keep the store online 24/7. Um, so, yeah, it's the user stories or the human factors task analysis. Um, but do that before you start to draw, and do the prioritization matrix before you start to draw. But then, when you start, you're ready to sketch. Step back and just say, okay, now that I know these objects and actions, all right. Particularly, start in the middle. What's the best page archetype to represent this, right? What's going to work best? Should it be a portal? Should it be a workspace? Should it be a dashboard? Make that conscious decision, right? And then make the architecture decision based on how many of those archetypes you're going to need and how much content's flowing through. And then when you're doing the detail design, be very, very conscious about your choice of widgets and controls. 
and not using the same widget in one screen to represent objects and another to hold a bunch of attribute values. Right. It's a different way of thinking about it. Yeah. And then you were sort of, were you whittling it down um, by un understanding what's accepted versus, or what's, what's understood versus what's not? Because you had some kind of table there where you were, you know, had X's in it and you were kind of filtering out what's, you know, it was that process of moving from 10X to 100X. Well, when I look at the tables, if, let me, let's go back to that screen to make sure I'm answering your question. Hang on a second. Let me share again. Okay, so we're talking about um, this screen, right? Yeah, or it might have been one of the really early ones. So this is what I'm saying here is basically, if you're looking at choosing your widgets or your controls, I'm indicating what is probably a legitimate choice and the large X being a primary when most people would expect and what would be acceptable, but you don't want to do all of these, right? So this is just when you're picking from the parts bin of GUI, what you're doing, right? As opposed to this chart, right? Where I was saying, okay, I'm so using the X here to say, this, act, this action and this object intersect. This is a legitimate pair. So which of these two things with X's were you asking about? I think it was more the first one that you had pulled up. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm saying look at the components and one mistake that people make a lot um, in class, uh, for example, is they use toggle buttons or combo boxes to represent, and they use a toggle to represent an action. So like the little slider, you know, from your phone and the behavior of the slider is if I move it from left to right, it adopts a dog, right? And that's not right. You know, the, that's an attribute value. Is the dog ready for adoption in the admin UI? That can be a slider, right? Yes, no. So again, it's all about being really consistent in your use of these uh, and not misusing them for something they weren't designed for. Because that's what people are going to expect, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what. Um, and again, don't use a slider and the cancer treatment for turning on the beam. Okay, that's right. a little too casual. It needs to be a big red, you know, button like you're about to nuke the patient here. You got to be really sure when you turn this sucker on that everything is set. Actually, fortunately, the machines are smart enough to know because they're image back, not to turn on if anything's on, not kill time. Okay, other questions? We have a few minutes left. I don't have a question as much as I have um, a, a remark. And I just, I, I wasn't, um, this is my second time I've seen your presentation as well. So I am um, still learning. I think I could probably sit in a hundred of these and still learn something new. So. I really appreciate your expertise um, and, and your delivery and your suggestions. Um, I just wish that you would have uh, come into my life like two years ago. There, there was an app that um, that I am actually been thrown in the middle of that has already been, um, it's, a, it's a greenfield app, uh, thrown in the middle of after it has been a hodgepodge design. And I see so many of these principles being um, violated. As, as far as the, the widgets and the, uh, the actions, and I'm, I'm trying to fix it midstream, and I can tell you that it would have been so much more efficient had, it, had these, uh, these issues been thought about at the very beginning of design. And I can tell you that the teams had no clue about how to structure the app. Um, and that, that just, so this is, this is very, very valuable for, for design teams. And I just think, I just praise your work. So thank you for this. Well, thank you for the compliment. And Layla, I'd be happy to repeat the presentation for your whole team. Mm. Just send me an email. As I said, I don't yeah. charge for this. 
That's awesome. Um, this isn't about money. This is about um, trying to get this pedagogy established as the academic standard and, and the practice standard because it works. And it's so much better than trial and error. And I've been the chief design officer for companies that sell you know, billions and billions of dollars of software, right? And every CEO, I mean, I worked for Larry Ellison for 11 years. It's not a big deal when you can walk in as the design manager and say, I have a value prop for this methodology and it's better faster. There's no CEO who's gonna, who's gonna argue with better faster, right? Better slower is a business decision. Right, but this is really better, faster. Um, and this is also how some of these companies were able to get into the billions and billions of dollars of revenue um, in, in software, um, as opposed to the blunt hammer of Facebook, which is entirely trial and error, um, except for their game theory. Their game theory, their game theory magicians are, are very skilled. They have some very good psychologists. Um, but other than that, and there are products that are very good as well. The PayPal guys have been using this for a while. Um, one of their managers was one of my readers over the years of putting this together. And I've worked with his wife. And you see in PayPal, you know, it's just damn clear on every screen, particularly if you're a business and you're using PayPal. They're very careful about their semantics. Um, okay, other questions? I have a question slash comment. Uh, this was, yeah, just to kind of echo some of the other comments, this was a fabulous thing, and I'm learning a lot of interesting points here. Um, the idea of um, the semantic nature of, of uh, these objects and actions, all these different, these, these, the pieces we make our designs up of, uh, is a really interesting thing, and I think that I've sort of learned and just intuited over my design mm -hmm. career, but I've never actually seen it uh, communicated this clearly. Um, and I think one thing that it shows up in is, I think, because we're, our team is uh, working on um, crafting a design system uh, and we are leaning heavily or somewhat on, on uh, a material, uh, material design. Mm -hmm. and I, I think your example of where they, uh, materials system uh, mixes the semantics or, or poorly identifies semantics was an interesting one. And I think, I guess, so the question I guess I have is, um, uh, I guess I'm just trying to think through how we can, how I can help um, communicate those types of things to our team to be using our objects semantically or these actions in it and, and well, semantically. I can't really give a, a very specific answer because I don't know obviously your product or your domain. Um, the first thing to do is do an audit. I have a number of teams at IBM uh, recently because I did it for probably about 2,000 people at IBM did this talk. Um, and I have probably two dozen students who work in various IBM teams um, over the years. Um, do an audit of where you're at and see what is it you're actually communicating in terms of conceptual model today and what can you do to simplify it. But when it comes to building a design system around it, look at the myth chapter in the book. It's not a short chapter. And it does deal with the business decisions of when you would or would not um, follow any given design standard, particularly Android and iOS, where you can get dinged pretty heavily um, for not following, or um, even if you do add-ons to salesforce.com, right? And you don't follow their um, lightning standard, they may not let you in their store. So there are semantic issues with these design languages. There's also business issues, and I deal with both in that chapter. Um, but I think you, you, can, you can definitely take material and you can overlay your own semantics. And what you'll be doing is you'll be turning off um, a third of the things that material does or changing them to be specific to your needs. And you'll just be limiting and being more consistent when, when you pick a piece of a, a material design where you use it and why you use it instead of just using it like a blunt hammer, right? You'll use it more like a scalpel. Yeah, I think, I think uh, thanks, so that's a great answer. I think that the, we're still sort of in our infancy and I think the biggest question I have here is more about evangelism for these models and ideas. And I think, uh, so yeah, it, but all that's, that's great. I, I think there's a lot of questions I think we still need to work through.
for sure. Thanks. Yeah, if you you know trying to do it and you need help, just um, give me a call. Sure. Okay, I think we have four minutes left. So anything else that people want to ask about? You want to, you want me to tell you what some of the common questions are that you haven't asked? Sure, that sounds good. There's two oh, um, that often come up. It kind of depends what people are doing. One is, how does this apply to conversational UX? We've been talking about GUI for almost 90 minutes, right? The only the difference in conversational, it still works, but you don't have the visualization layer. So in conversational, you still have the conceptual model. A, an action plus an object is equivalent to an Alexa skill, right? Or an object, in effect, you could say it's equivalent to a skill, right? The object is the weather. And now you have actions that you can request to be taken on the information related to the weather. But conversational UX is hard because now it's almost all recall, right? It'd be short-term versus long-term memory, but you don't have the recognition. So inherently, conversational UI will never have low cognitive load. And that's why it's been oversold, right? But as humans, we're, we're, not, we're not well equipped um, to have extensively long conversations where we need to recall a lot of things. Um, and it also, the semantic approach works really well for VR and AR. Um, I know a number of people who work in that area who, who use it because, again, it's all about objects and actions, whether you're using a gesture and reaching out to a virtual object. It's all semantics. That's the only way people can understand AR and VR. This is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for uh, presenting for us and taking the time. We really appreciate it. This was fascinating. You're very welcome. So if you have questions, um, you know, and you're reading the book and you don't understand something, let me know because I need that feedback um, for version two. Okay, thank you guys. Everybody stay safe. Have a good day. Great, thank you, Daniel. Thank Bye. you.